John 20 and verses 11 through 18. Now, today we're going to study what went on after the resurrection of Christ, after Peter and John have run to the, to the tomb because Mary Magdalene has told them the tomb is empty. And so they have run to the tomb, they've seen that it's empty, they are standing there, and then they go home. This is where we ended Notice in verse 10 of chapter 20, it says, Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Verse 11, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And so Mary is left. So Mary must have run back with Peter and John and come back with them because they leave and she remains. And here is the account of her personal encounter with the risen Christ. Now this particular text is not found in any of the other Gospels. So this is really new information. And it is specific to this particular Gospel. And it gives us, I believe, some tremendous insight into grief and how to handle grief in our own individual lives. So let's read. Verse 11, it says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. So she takes a second look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Interesting. The same question is given by Jesus now. Whom are Are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher or master. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Did they believe her? No, they did not. They still did not believe her. And yet, she was the first one to be allowed to see and to speak to the risen Savior. Interesting. We'll get to that in a minute. So Mary's love, Mary's grief here. Very interesting topic. Now the question here is posed twice. Once by the angels, next by Jesus. And whenever a question is asked twice, you know that it's a pretty important question because it wouldn't be asked if it wasn't important. It's important for us to note this. This is why it's recorded for us, to stop us and arrest our attention and ask that same question. Why was she weeping? Well, from our perspective, looking back at it, we would ask the question, well, honey, you, you just don't know Jesus is alive. That's, that's the problem. But to her, it was the most natural thing in the world to be weeping, right? Because they've taken away her Lord. He's not only been crucified in front of her eyes, but now he's missing from the tomb. And as, she, as you read this, 
I mean, especially when the, the angels in verse 13 ask her, why are you weeping? It almost seems like she's a little ticked off. She's a little angry at them. And, well, it's obvious because they've taken away my Lord. That's why I'm weeping. And, you know, don't you guys get it? And so she's just a little bit upset and very emotional, very uh, grief-stricken that the Lord is gone. He's, he's not there. Yet the question of the angels and of Christ is to help us to look a little deeper into this issue of grief. Now, everybody in this room is going to experience grief. It's going to happen. It's part of life. It's a part of living in this fallen world. And you're going to experience people in your family and your friends who are going to die around you. And you're going to have to deal with grief. So learning how to deal with grief and keeping that balance in your life about this subject is really important. Because grief can be overwhelming. Grief can be completely debilitating in a person's life. I've seen it happen in people over the years of my ministry here. I've watched it. And sometimes that person just disappears and you don't see him anymore. And you think to yourself, what's happening? What's going on? You talk to him, you contact him, and they are overwhelmed by the grief or the loss of their spouse or their child or whatever. And Many times, you know, especially with the loss of a child in a, in a marriage, many times that marriage will not even survive because of the intense grief that takes place. I've watched that take place as well. And it's, so it's something you have to deal with. And I believe there's some great instruction here in this particular text that will help you tremendously. You have to have a balance. Now, from the angel's perspective, from Christ's perspective, they wanted to point her to the fact of the resurrection. And the resurrection really is the key to handling grief. Because if you realize that there is something more, then you will be able to handle your grief in a much better way. You see, the world looks at death and it's a hopeless grief. Christians look at death as a hopeful grief. And so there's, there are two ways that you can look at that. This is found, I believe, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 when Paul talks about grief. And he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those that have died lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So there are people who sorrow with no hope. It's a hopeless sorrow, a hopeless grief. And he's trying to give them that balance. And if you read the context there, he's going to explain to them about the resurrection. So the resurrection is what gives a person hope. In 1 Peter 1.3, Peter there says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So when Jesus said to his disciples, Because I live, you will live also. You see, that is what is, must be the key to our view. We have to view life and death with the view of the resurrection. Now, when a person experiences tragedy in their life, a Christian experiences tragedy in their life, I mean, the worst that you can imagine that could take place in a person's life and the grief that comes over somebody's soul at that moment, no matter how bad it gets, you have to realize that there is something yet future. There is something beyond this life. 
that death is not the end. That there is a, another life to come. And this life is very temporary. And one day we will, we will have a new life. Many times I think that when we, we are sorrowful, we are literally focused just on ourselves. I believe Jesus revealed this when he said in Luke 23, verse 28, as he is carrying the cross through the streets of the city of Jerusalem, and he cannot carry his cross any longer. Obviously, he has stumbled, he has fallen, and they, the Roman soldiers commandeer a man, and they ask him or command him to carry the cross of Christ. And at that moment, Jesus looks at these women who are weeping beside him and weeping for him. And he says to them in Luke 23, 28, he says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Because Jesus is about to tell them what's going to occur, what's going to take place in their lives and the future of the city of Jerusalem. It'll be destroyed. So he's saying, don't weep for me. I'm, I am on my way to a new body and into, back to, the, to be seated with the Father once again. But weep for yourselves. And that really is what we do. We weep for ourselves because we don't get to be with that person. If we thought about where they were, rejoicing and jumping for joy in the presence of the Lord, we wouldn't be weeping for them at all. We, would, we only weep for ourselves. Now, the only exception to that is when someone is not a believer. Then, yes, we're going to weep for them, and we should weep for them. And if you don't want to ever have that kind of weeping, then make sure you share the gospel with those around you and proclaim the good news to them. At least they have an, then an opportunity to hear. An essential thing. And so balancing this, does the resurrection change our grief at all? It should. It must. If we have that correct view and correct balance of that, then we will. You know, memorial services are a time of grief and a time of joy. When, when you know where that person is, you should rejoice for them. And yet, there is always going to be grief as long as we are in this world. And I remember doing my mother's memorial service. And we, my family just gathered together up in the Sierras uh, where she had taken us as, as boys, and we did a memorial service there. Man, it was the hardest memorial service I have ever done in my entire life. Because I, it was hard to even get out the words that I was saying because there was so much emotion. So grief is a good thing. It's a normal thing. Don't ever be ashamed of grief. Don't be ever be ashamed. God's created you to cry. That's a good thing. So, especially for you tough guys that say, I don't ever cry. Well, the older you get, the easier it will become. <laughs> because of the reality of life. It's reality. And when you experience loss after loss, you're going to, well, the tears will flow, and it'll be natural. Now, the second thing in this is that the clouding effect of grief. Let me just talk to you about that. Why is it here that Mary does not recognize Jesus? I think that she is overwhelmed by her grief. She is angry, and she is overwhelmed. I, I can read the anger in this statement as she, as she speaks to first the angels and then to the gardener. I mean, who she thinks is the gardener, but it's really in reality is Jesus. 
And she, it says there, she said in verse 15, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I mean, there's some curtness in her voice. You can hear it. You can read it. And many times when people are overwhelmed by their grief, you know, they get angry with you because of their loss. They're upset. I mean, where I, I'm not going I'm not gonna be able to see this person again. And I, I love them. I care for them. And so sometimes as you try to comfort people, people will get angry with you. So for, be prepared for that. I've had many individuals get angry with me, and they take out their anger basically on you for their loss. So be prepared for it. But it's not really anger at you. They're just upset they have lost someone that they truly care about and they love. And yet, she doesn't recognize him here. Now, he possibly could have been, you know, had his back to her. I mean, that's possible. But she doesn't recognize him even when he speaks to her at the beginning in verse 15. He says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And, well, he knows exactly who she's seeking but he's asking her these questions to draw her out. And she just does not recognize who he is. And so her grief literally has, is crowding out and clouding her vision of who he is. And many times this is, I have found this is the case as well. Overwhelming grief can literally cloud your view of your own solution, of your of, and the person that many times is standing right next to you trying to help you, you get angry with them. And so your, your grief, overwhelming grief, just, it just clouds your, your vision. Now, can a person ever have too much grief? Yes, they can. One of the best examples of this is in 2 Corinthians 2.7. Now you remember this is the man that uh, Paul is talking here in the context about a man who has sinned and they have uh, removed him from the church and he has repented and Paul is saying, receive this man back in to the church. Comfort him, forgive him. And this is what he says, on the contrary, you ought to rather to forgive and to comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So a person can be swallowed, literally, swallowed up by too much sorrow. And that's when the person just disappears and they don't answer their phone and you go and knock on their door and they don't answer the door. You better pursue them because they're swallowed up by too much sorrow. And so this is, I believe, where Mary was at. She was completely distraught at this moment in her life. Another great example of this emotion and how it clouds your view of your own solution. There's a story in the Old Testament in Genesis 21 where Hagar is, has been removed from the household of Abraham because her son was doing something with Isaac. That's a whole other story. But she is removed from the home, and she goes out into the wilderness. She uses up all of her, her water. Uh, she believes that she and her son uh, Ishmael are going to die of thirst in the wilderness. She sets the boy down over under a, uh, a bush and she goes over away from the child and says, I can't, I can't watch him die. And she just is overwhelmed by weeping and grief. And then all of a sudden the Lord intervenes. And this is what he says to her in Genesis 21, 17. God heard the voice of the lad. Notice that. 
Then the angel of the Lord called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the who? The lad, where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, and I will make him a great nation. Then God opened his, her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave to the lad to drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So isn't this interesting here? She is so overwhelmed by by her grief that she sets her son down, and who's doing the praying? The lad. She is so overwhelmed by grief, she's not even praying. Or God would have heard her. And then secondly, God has to open her eyes so she sees a well, which is the solution to her problem, right next to her. I mean, isn't that interesting? You can be so overwhelmed by by grief that you can't even see the solution that is right next to you. Again, I have seen this happen so many times. People are so upset that they can't see the trees for the forest, basically. They can't see the solution. When you tell them the solution, many times they argue with you because of their overwhelming grief. But that's why the Lord sends you in the first place. And so, whether he uses you or an angel from heaven, he wants to get through to that person who is in overwhelming grief. Grief. Now, what was it that awakened Mary to who this gardener was? It's just one word. When he spoke her name, Mary. He, she didn't unpick it up when he's asking her, what, why are you weeping? But she immediately understood who he was when he spoke her name. Have you ever heard the Lord speak your name? Do you know he knows you by name? Do you know that? He knows every single one of you by name. If he can, you know, create the heavens and every star, the billions upon trillions of stars, and he calls them all out by name, that's what the scripture says. He knows you by name. In John 10, verses 3 and 4, There it says, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I hope you are cultivating hearing his voice. And you know the only way you do that is by sitting still in the presence of God. I hope that you do that. If you just, you know, go through your list of prayers and close the book and move on to the day, you're, you're going to miss something. I, I've heard the Lord call my name and say, Steve, stop it. Stop thinking that way. Stop doing that. Start listening to me. I've heard his voice. I hope that you have heard his voice because he will speak if you will set some time aside to listen. He wants to talk to you and he will talk to you if you will give him that opportunity. And so you have to hear his voice, especially when you're in a time of grief or sorrow where things are going the opposite direction you want to see them go. That's when you have to hear his voice. And so wait upon him during those times. It's extremely important. Now one last thing here uh, before we go on is Mary's incredible love for Jesus. You know, this is probably one of the most outstanding parts of this whole section of Scripture is her love for him. How do I know she loved him? Well, because she was the first one to go to the tomb, right? 
And she was the first one to see Jesus. She came back a second time to the tomb, which again shows that passionate love that she has had toward Jesus. And so she came back again. And when the angels say, why are you weeping? What does she say? Tell me where you have taken away my Lord. You see, she still thinks he's dead. But she still calls him my Lord. He's still my Lord. Then when Jesus speaks to her, her response was, teacher, master. I mean, those are, those are terms that only can be said by someone that you, you love. You love that person. You know they are your teacher, your master. And then the thing that she does next is a very physical action that shows her love. She puts a death grip on him like no other. How do I know that? Because he turns around in verse 17 and says, do not cling to me. Physically cling to me. So that's what obviously she was doing. She wrapped her arms around him and said, I am never letting you out of my sight again. I love you. You are my master. You are my Lord. And this, this passionate love that she had toward him was powerful. And I wonder, is this the reason why she is the first one that he reveals himself to? Think about that. I'll bet. I'll bet you any money. Because she loved him. So where did she get this love for Jesus? Think about this. I mean, I have people come to me and say, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I have a love for Jesus like you all, all you people here at church have for, for Jesus. What, what's the difference? Has anybody ever asked you that? said that to you? It's, an, it's a very important question. And it's, I believe it has to be answered. What gave Mary this kind of love? Well, Mary was, well, she was a sinner. And she knew she was a sinner. It declares in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, that Mary, when she came to Christ, had seven demons inside of her. Seven demons that Jesus cast out. Now, you don't get seven demons in you by going to Sunday school. I guarantee you. Um, you know, she was, she had a past, okay? And so this particular woman, I believe, saw what great mercy God had had upon her, what great grace he had had upon her, and he had forgiven her. And I think that's the reason why she loved him so greatly. Let me give you another reason. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, here is a story of when Jesus went into the house of Simon the Pharisee. You remember the story? He went in and Simon said, come on in here, have dinner. But he didn't wash Jesus' feet. He didn't anoint him with oil. He didn't give him a kiss. He didn't do anything. He just said, yeah, come on in here, eat. Didn't give him the normal things that you do when a guest comes to your house for dinner. And so then this woman comes in. She began to anoint Jesus. And she began to weep and then wash her tears away from his feet with her hair. And Jesus said, and then Simon, he gets all indignant. He goes, he thinks, the scripture says he thought inside himself, well, if this guy was really a prophet, if this Jesus was really a prophet, then he'd know this woman was a sinner and he would not allow her to touch him. And so Jesus responded and he said this in Luke seven forty seven. He said, her sins, which are many. So he acknowledges that this woman, which I don't believe is Mary, I believe this is another woman. 
This woman's sins are many. So he acknowledges he knows that they are. But she said, he said, which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So when people ask me that question, how come I don't have the same love and passion for Jesus like all you people do? Well, this is what I explain to them. Then you, you don't see who you are. You don't see what you have done and what he has done to forgive you. Because when you see the grace that he has bestowed upon you and how he has forgiven you much, then I guarantee you, you will love him much. And you will have a passion toward him. So, you know, if you just feel like blah inside today, I would just say, Lord, open my eyes to my sin. Open my eyes to your incredible grace for my sin. And you know what will happen? You will naturally fall in love with Jesus. That's what will happen. That's where that passion is. And if you're, as a, you as a believer maybe don't have that anymore, you have done what the scripture says, calls, you have left your first love. If there's no fire there, then there's no first love. And that first love comes from this very reason. So open my eyes, Lord, to my sin. Open my eyes to your grace and what you have done to forgive me, the mercy that you have bestowed upon me. I mean, Mary knew she had been delivered from the worst bondage that could ever be in a person's life, being demon-possessed. And she was free. And she knew she was free. And she knew who set her free. Do you know who has set you free? That's, that's the key. You know, Paul had an incredible passion for, for Christ. He had a love for Christ. And he tells us why in 1 Timothy 1.15. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He knew he was a chief sinner. And that's why he loves and love the Lord so greatly. Now last year in verses 17 and 18, just a couple of things here before we go. Why does Jesus say to Mary, do not cling to me? And I believe this is physically cling to him. Why is he telling her, hold off, don't do this? He's, he's basically saying, you know, take it easy. I'm okay. You're okay, I'm okay, and... This is, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. He tells her the, this for two reasons. First, don't worry, I'm going to be here for a while. I have not yet ascended to my father. So I'm going to be here for a while, so we'll get to talk again. And Jesus did. He spent 40 days after the resurrection with the disciples. And so that 40 days, he met with them often. And we have many of those uh, sessions recorded for us in Scripture. The second reason that I think he told her this is because he was telling her that the, the time that she will need to cling to him was when she, he was ascended into heaven. That's when she's going to need to cling to him, not physically, but spiritually cling to him. Now, the reason why I say that is because the scripture teaches us from beginning to end that we need to cling to him. Why? Because you can't do it on your own. If you think you can do it on your own, then you will not cling to him. You won't go to him. You won't seek him. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 20, it says this. Moses said that you may love the Lord your God. There it is the love of God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. Why? For he is your life and the length of your days. So why do we cling to him? 
Because we love him. Why do we obey him? Because we love him. Then in Psalm 119, verse 31, there David said, I cling to your testimonies. O Lord, do not put me to shame. Why do you cling to his testimonies, his word? Because you love him. Because you know he loves you. And then in the New Testament, Romans 12, 9. There, Paul said, let love be without hypocrisy. Notice, again, the topic is love. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Why do I abhor what is evil? Why do I cling to what is good? Because of love. Because I know I love him and because he first loved me. That is why. So it is an essential thing that you cling to him. You need to cling to him. On a daily basis, you should be clinging to him by prayer as you open his word, as you obey him, as you follow him. Cling to him because he is your life. And also, what, is, what does Jesus mean here when he said, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God? What is he saying there? When many times people read through this and they, they just kind of, you know, struggle with that little phrase and they say, what is he saying? It's a very simple phrase. It's a phrase, he's telling them where he is going, and he's speaking from his humanity here. He's going to the God that he serves, okay? He's going to his own Father. And he's describing here his submission to the Father, that he one day will see, be seated next to the Father. Now, it's interesting that uh, Augustine, one of the early church fathers, he said this. He said, here Jesus declares that he is, he is Christ God and Father, but he says he is that by nature. And he also declares that we have the Father as our God by grace. And that is the reason why he declares here he does not use the term, he doesn't say our Father or our God. He says, my Father, my God. Because Jesus has a unique relationship with the Father. You see, I am going to be at the feet of Christ. I'm going to be at the foot of the throne of Christ, worshiping him. He is going to be seated on the same throne as the Father. There are not two thrones. There's one throne, and they will be seated side by side. That is clear from the Scripture. Look it up. Check it out in the book of Revelation. It's there. So it is an essential thing that you see this, this unique relationship that Jesus has with his own Father. And the relationship I have with him as my father. Now last here, notice in the middle of verse 17. What does Jesus tell Mary to do? He says, go to my brethren. Go to my brethren. Go to my brethren and tell them what? Well, in the other gospels, he tells her there, go tell them that I'm going to meet them in Galilee. And so the one thing, the central thing that Jesus wants Mary to do is not cling to him, not get be, you know, all caught up in the worship of that moment, but he wants her to go to work. What do I mean by work? Well, being about your father's business. And what is that? Telling others about him. You see, we need to tell the world that Jesus is alive. And here Jesus is saying, you know what? There's a time to, to worship. There's a time to cling. But 
there's also a time to work. And that's the time that we're in right now. We have a, we have a great opportunity to come and worship, and then we have to go forth and go to work and be about our Father's business. And what is that? It's going to his brethren to encourage. That's why the scripture says exhort one another daily. That's what you need to do with each other every day. Exhort your husbands, your wives, your children, your friends, your other, your, the people you go to church with. Exhort them. And with those that do not know him, you need to preach the gospel. In Mark 16, 15, the very last thing that Jesus said to the disciples, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. That's our business. If we do not share the gospel with others, we are not fulfilling our business. We're not doing our job. Now, people say, well, that's good for... I'll just let them do it, and that person do it. I'll let them do it. No, that's your job. Every single one of you in this room, that's your job. You say, but Steve, you don't know me. You don't, you don't know. I, I, just, I can't talk to anybody about Jesus. Well, you can. If you ask the Lord to train you and teach you, you can. If you ask for that passionate love in your heart, you can. You will. I guarantee you that's what is needed. The perfect love of God will cast out the fear you have in your soul. So I would challenge you this week, if you truly want to be an evangelical Christian, ask the Lord for an opportunity sometime this week to share the gospel with someone. We have a bunch of tracks out there on the wall you can pick them up, they're free, and just hand one to someone and share the gospel with them. When the Lord opens that opportunity, you will hear his voice and he'll say, now, I want you to share right now. That's when your heart starts pounding, right? You know, you've been there, you've all had that experience. So that means you've heard his voice, right? Right? telling you to share your faith. And that's what it's all about. If you say, I don't know how to do that, go to our website and you can learn how to do that. Just go to our discipleship page. There's all kinds of explanation there on how to share your faith, how to answer people's questions. It, it's all there. All you got to do is go study it. Amen? Let's go to him in, in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, you are so ready, so able, so willing to reach out to us. Lord, I pray that you would make us ready and willing and able to reach out to others. Lord, I pray that you would first just give us that, that special love for one another. Lord, that we would see the, the family that you have brought us into. That's what church is all about, is a family. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to love our family. And I pray that you would also then turn our eyes toward those that we, we come in contact with that don't know you. Lord, help us to go to them, to share with them our faith. Lord, I pray that you would open that door, that opportunity for each one of us here to share our faith with someone this week. And Lord, I pray that you would make that so obvious to each of us that we will not be able to deny it. And then I pray you would fill us with your, your love so that we would just, that, sense that fear just drain from our soul and that we would just ooze the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to do that. Lord, we believe you to do it. We believe you're going to do that as surely as we're asking it even now. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that if you are here this morning 
and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to respond to him today. You need to do that right where you sit, right in your own heart. If you say, I don't know what to pray, well, come on up here after service. Let us pray with you. You need to make a confession of faith. You may need to make a decision. You need to humble yourself and just come and receive him today. Father, we ask that you will do that work in each heart here that doesn't know you. In Jesus' name, amen.